Hello and welcome to today's lecture on human environment interaction. The lecture was written and is given by myself, Chris Gall. And today's lecture corresponds to topic 1.5, Human Environment Interaction in the College Board Outline for AP Human Geography Version 1, Effective 2019. The enduring understanding for today's lecture is geographers analyze relationships among and between places to reveal important spatial patterns. The learning objective for today's lecture is to explain how major geographic concepts illustrate spatial relationships. The essential knowledge for today's lectures, today's lecture are 1. The concepts of nature and society include sustainability, natural resource, and land use. 2. Theories regarding the interaction of the natural environment with human societies have, have evolved from environmental determinism to possibilism. <clears throat> so, at its most basic level, this is about how humans impact and change the natural environment. That can include everything from the house that you build to the school you attend, the park that is up the street from you that is mostly trees and hiking trails, or beach, to the vegetable garden that I keep in my backyard during the summer. Ultimately, human environment interaction is about how we use the land and what we use it for. In this course, we're going to look at a ton of ways that people use land, including everything from the development of cities to what kinds of farms and factories can be found where. And, of course, we will look at the impact of those developments on the natural environment. But at the end of the day, it's not just about the impact that humans have on the environment, but that the environment can have on humans. For example, it's just not feasible to build a hut out of corrugated tin and palm fronds here in the Seattle area. For summer, sure it would be okay, a little cold at night, but not fatally so. <clears throat> but in the winters, especially in the darkest parts of the winters, it is too cold and wet for that to be a viable option. On the other hand, there are parts of the world where that, while it's not the preferred option of most people, will keep you sufficiently warm and dry for much of the year. So, humans change the environment, and the environment impacts the choices that people make. Historically, geographers tended to think that the environment limited the choices that people would make, and that these choices were in turn a direct result of the relative intelligence of the people involved. Thus, colder climates, like those in Northern Europe, say Great Britain, forced folks to become smarter and more innovative. Warmer climates, like those around the equator that can be found in many Pacific islands, uh, like, say, for example, Hawaii, allowed folks to be lax and less creative when it came to how they supplied their basic needs. Because folks around the equator did not need to be innovative, they tended to be less intelligent and less creative problem solvers. Thus, they developed economically and mentally at a much slower pace and were a different species of human. This then helped to reinforce the prejudices at the time, leading to a loop where people were thought dumber, so were treated worse, and if they... as and as if they actually were dumber, so that many of them then lived down to that expectation, reinforcing the stereotype and so forth. This theory is called environmental determinism. What this fails to take into account, however, is the differential access to resources and the creative ways in which various groups of people solved problems that were not faced by other groups. For example, Britain never has to deal with the substantial rainfalls during the monsoon season that India does. Thus, India would have, of necessity, developed ways of dealing with flooding that would never have occurred to the British, who simply didn't face the problem. Britain did, however, increase the ability of farmers to go grow crops quicker and more efficiently than in other areas. This then created a workforce that was no longer tied to the land. They didn't have to farm in order to feed themselves. Thus, factories started to develop as a way to feed and close those folks. But then factories had still other impacts on population and agriculture, as well as economics. I'm significantly shortcutting the story of the Industrial Revolution, but you get the idea. The Industrial Revolution came about because of a confluence of available resources, labor, creativity, and timing. The fact that it happened in Britain first is as much about British history as it is about the environment of Britain or the relative ingenuity of the British people. Indeed, if you study the history of India, you will find incredible diversity in economic activity and find that one of the things that the British did during the Raj was that they suppressed Indian textile makers in order to increase the markets for British goods. Thus, Britain developed much economically much quicker than India, in part because of British power over India, not about the native ingenuity of the Indian peoples. This idea that people would take their environment and mold it to suit their needs and desires, and that while the environment may guide those choices, <clears throat> I grew up in Alaska and can say that I've slept in an igloo, how about you? Um, it does not limit them. 
nor does it determine the relative intelligence or the groups of people who inha- of the groups of people who inhabit certain areas. This is called environmental possibilism or just possibilism. And again, it's the idea that um, people can overcome the limits that the environment sets. The easy way to tell the difference: Does the environment determine the outcome? Determinism, or merely influence the possibility of some choices being made over others? <clears throat> That's possibilism. These days, geographers believe that people are incredibly creative in all environments, and that while the environment may make some choices less likely to be made than others, it does not limit the ability of people to develop and grow. Thus, when we approach environmental limits, we choose ways in which we will try to overcome them. Possibilism, not simply turn around and head a different direction. Determinism. As we make these choices, we need to balance our desires for what is both best for the environment and what is best for us including things like how we do or don't exploit natural resources and what types of sustainable or not practices that we engage in. We have to evaluate the potential options and to to determine if they are things that we can continue to do for generations, sustainable, or things that will permanently harm the natural environment, not sustainable. Great examples of this include current debates around what types of energy we want to use and what types of energy we can or should use in various environments. Is it feasible to provide energy from solar panels in Seattle? Or should we aim for wind energy? Or maybe we want to try water energy? Or should we go with nuclear or coal for energy? Maybe we can do different things at different times a year? Or should we focus on increasing storage capacity for energy so that we could specialize and have some off-peak seasons? And have some for off-peak seasons. At the individual level, these decisions look like, can I afford to put solar panels on my rooftop? We replaced our roof a few years ago with just midline slate tiles, which is what most people around here use. It still cost us ten grand. If we had done solar panels, it would have more than doubled the amount. Should we have a rain barrel to help to use to help water our yard? When is it appropriate to use our outdoor fireplace? All of these choices factor into what is sustainable and not, and what people are going to do or not do in a given environment. <clears throat> so, the essential knowledge for this letter, lecture, which you should take a few minutes to check your notes and confirm that you have information pertaining to the following, that the concepts of nature and society include sustainability, natural resources, and land use, and that the theories of inter- regarding the interaction of the natural environment with human societies have evolved from environmental determinism to environmental possibilism. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to sharing more with you next time.